that was easy. Hi, so I want to talk about the totally quantified Boolean formula or TQBF problem. So what in the world is this problem? If you know what SAT Boolean formulas are, it's actually very similar, it's just a generalization of them. So what is a normal formula, which I'm going to call a non-quantified one, is just a normal Boolean formula. So you got some ors and variables and nots and ands and all that kind of stuff. You can combine them in any way that you want as long as you have ands, ors, and nots and some variables. A quantified formula is where you have some quantifiers on the variables. And you have two of them in this particular case. So you have an upside down A, which means for all, and the backwards E, which means exists. I have no idea why they developed that notion. Why don't they just say capital A here and forward E? I have no idea, but that's just the notion that they used. So this says that the formula must be true for both occurrences of X1. So both possibilities of X1. So if X1 is true, this has to be true. And if x1 is false, this also has to be true. And x2 went, because it has an exists on the front of it, that says either one of them has to satisfy the formula. So if x2 is true, this may, may or may not be true. If x2 is false, this may or may not satisfy the formula. As long as at least one of them satisfies the formula, then we're good. So x3 is an exists in this particular case. x4 is a for all, so the formula better be true for both of them. And for x5, either one has to be satisfying the formula, okay? And of course, we can have any combination of exists and for alls that we like. So the original formula here is actually an example of a totally quantified one where every variable is an exists. As long as there exists an assignment to satisfy the formula to make it true, then we will say that this thing is true. So the non-quantified one is just a special case of the totally quantified one. And so therefore, because we know that SAT is NP complete, this problem must be at least NP hard. It may or may not be NP complete. We actually don't know whether it's in NP or not because we don't know of a polynomial, non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm to handle the for all part. Because for all, you essentially have to go down both sides of looking at that and the formula could be totally different depending on whether you set a variable to be true or to be false. Maybe there is one, but we just haven't been able to find one yet. So we can easily show that TQBF is in P space. So is in polynomial amount of space. And the way that you do this is you just try every single possible variable assignment, but you do it in a weird way. So you look at this variable up front. And what we can do without loss of generality, these quantifiers can actually be inside here somewhere, but without loss of generality, I can put them out front. So this is something called prenex normal form. So I'm just gonna write prenex here. Prenex just means you put the quantifiers out front and you can do that without loss of generality here. And you should probably think about that, but it's pretty easy. So here, let's just say that this is a for all. So then if we have a for all here, so let's say for all x i, then what you do is you do the recursion on this for setting that variable to be true. So set the x i to be true. And then you do another side where x i is false. So then what you do is you do the recursive calls here and you return true if and only if both of these return true. And if you have an exists on the front of it, you try doing this exactly the same way. And what you do there is you return true at this level if and only if at least one of these two evaluates to true. So the for all one, you have to return both whether they're true and false, whether the formula is true. And here you just work with one of them. So as long as one of them is, is good, then we can ignore the other one. So then does this actually run into polynomial amount of space? Remember, polynomial space means unlimited time. And I claim that it does. Because what you can do is, let's say that you do the work on this side right here. Then on this side, before you even start this side, erase all the work that you did over here and just keep the information about whether that left side was true or not. And in fact, you don't even need to keep that around because what you can do is if this side evaluates to false for the for all guy, 
then there's no point in evaluating the right side because no matter what, you're gonna return false here anyway. And there's a little bit of a shortcut you can do here too. If the left side, for example, evaluates to true, then you don't even need to do the right side. So effectively, you can erase all the information about this left side before you move on to the right side. And if you think about it, if you think about how deep the recursion has to go, well, you only need to keep around the information that's relevant to the one side that you happen to choose down. So therefore, you only need a certain amount of information per variable. So then the only thing that you need to keep around, if you're looking at, let's say, x1 right here, is the rest of the formula. So effectively, it's going to be linear space for each one of these variables right here. And since it's linear space per variable, and we have linear number of variables, therefore, in total, I'm going to use a quadratic amount of space because I have a linear amount of space for each and a linear number of variables. And so therefore, we can run in a polynomial amount of space. It doesn't matter which polynomial as long as it runs in a polynomial. You can probably shave that down a little bit to get below uh, quadratic, but here it's totally fine as long as we show this quadratic. Okay. And you may think, okay, why are we talking about this problem? We're going to show that it's p-space complete, which is what we're going to do next. Okay, so how do we actually show that this particular problem is p-space hard? Well, what we need to do is take any problem that runs in a polynomial amount of space and then do a reduction to the TQBF problem, such that the formula that you make has a satisfying answer if and only if the input to the original problem is in the particular language. So let's say that we want to show that some language A, which is in P space, so let's write that down. And what we're going to show is that A poly reduces to TQBF. And of course, what this means is that if we have some string W in A, then that's if and only if some reduction, which is going to, I'm going to call it F here, on that particular uh, string W is in TQBF. And of course, this thing could be anything, right? Where we have to deal with any polynomial space language that you want. So we know nothing about it other than that the algorithm to solve it runs in polynomial amount of space. And this one has to be a totally quantified Boolean formula because that's, those are the instances to TQBF. So let's say that A uses n to the k space. We don't know necessarily exactly what polynomial, but we know that it is actually a polynomial. What are we going to do here? Well, we know that A runs in a polynomial amount of space, but we don't know actually how much time that it runs. Well, we can actually determine that, which is pretty cool. So if it runs in a polynomial amount of space, then the amount of time that it could theoretically use is going to be exponential in the amount of space because of the number of configurations. In fact, let's just say that it's going to be 2 to the big O n to the k uh, time in the, in the absolute worst case, because each of the cells, it represents one cell of the whole configuration, and the whole configuration could be n to the k in size. And so each one of those cells could be a constant number of values. And that's what the constant is up here. So the two doesn't really have to be a two. It could be E or some higher number than one. As long as you can always just change the constant up here and it'll be fine. But essentially it's gonna be exponential in the runtime here. But it'll actually be convenient to think about this as a perfect power of two. So let's say just as an example that this is two times D n to the K time. It's, as long as we pick a sufficiently high choice of D then we're perfectly fine here. As long as D is a constant, it doesn't depend on N or K, it's just a universal constant for A. So then, now that we have a, this number, which is a perfect power of 2, it just makes things easier a little bit down the line. Well, if it's a power of 2, well, let's think about what the, the machine's actually going to do. So we have the start configuration right here, and let's say that we have the accept configuration right here. Then we can use a savage style proof of argument to say we want to use only a polynomial amount of space to solve this particular problem. Well, what we want to do is to think about, well, 
if in how the Sabbath proof went, what we did was we said, okay, can we get to some configuration down here in the middle? Then if we can, if we can represent going from here to here, and then from here to here, then we are good. The problem is, how do we actually represent that with a formula? And with a normal SAT formula, you actually can't. But what you can do is to work with exists and for alls to get this to actually work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a little formula, well, little, <laughs> little formula right here that represents, I'm going to call it C1, C2, and T, which is going to be the formula. So what we want this to mean is that if this configuration up here is called C1 and this bottom one is C2, then I want this to be true exactly when, if we can go from C1 to C2 down here in T steps. And we can assume without loss of generality based on the stuff we did above that T is a perfect power of two. So then what we can do is we can say, is there some configuration in here that's halfway in between and we can get from one to the other. So I'm going to say that this is equal to, there exists some middle guy I'm going to call M right here, such that the formula representing C1 going to M with T over two steps has to be true. And it must be the case that going from M to C2 in T over two steps is also true. So as long as I can get from here to here in t over two steps and from here to here in t over two steps, therefore, as long as there's some guy in here that works, therefore we're good. Try to think about why this won't work because this is effectively what the NP style reduction actually does. It's actually a very interesting question about whether this actually will work. So try to think about why it won't work. So pause the video and then I'll reveal the answer after that. So the reason is that the formula actually gets too big and we only want a formula that's polynomial in size compared to the original input that we have. So how does, how do we actually deal? How do we actually show that? So how do I actually show that? Well, here, think about what we're doing here. So this is going down one level in the recursion and the formula is doubling in size. <laughs> So if we have m levels of recursion that we got to go down, the formula is going to be 2 to the m size, and that's going to be exponential in the size of the original thing, and that's not good. So we can actually leverage the fact that we have for alls here, and we can show that that will get us a polynomial size solution. So how do we incorporate for alls here? We're not going to do this guy right here, but we're going to instead do this. So I'm going to have phi c1 c2 t is the same idea as before and we still have that there exists some mid configuration right here so we're going to fold it in a particularly interesting way so i'm going to look at for all pairs of c3 and c4 so these are also configurations in addition to m so where are these c3s and c4s coming into play they're going to be um, C3 is going to correspond to C1 first, and then C4 is going to represent M. And then the second time, the, where the for all comes into play, is going to be M and then C2 right here. And the technical way of actually dealing with this, because you can't really have two for alls right here, what we're going to do is we're going to have a pair, which is going to be C3, C4. And that pair is going to be in this particular set. So this is going to be in this particular set. And I might as well move it up a little bit. So C3 and C4 is going to be a pair. And we're going to loop over, so to speak, both possibilities here. So C3 is going to be assigned C1. And at the same time, C4 is going to be assigned to M. And then the second time through for the other for part of the for all, the C3 is going to be assigned M and C4 is going to be assigned C2. And then the formula here is going to be really easy. It's going to be phi C3, C4, and T over 2. So the T over 2 is still there. It's just that we needed to break this up into two parts so that the 
the formula doesn't actually really change, it's just that the size changes. So effectively, we are doing the original thing, except now we're dealing with a for all, and that's just making the formula sufficiently smaller. In fact, this is going to be a polynomial in size of the original instance that we have. So there's actually some things that we need to worry about. We're here, the a algorithm can run in any polynomial that it wants. We assume that it was n to the k. Well, these configurations here can be at most uh, n to the k cells. Let me write k correctly. And actually, that's going to be true of c3 and c4, right? Because they are configurations too. So let's just make sure that this actually works correctly. Well, is it a polynomial in the size of the original thing? The, the thing is that how deep does this recursion go? This is totally fine right here because we're only have th having three instances of configurations, and so three times n to the k is still going to be a constant times n to the k. But what about the whole formula? This is just for a particular choice of c1, c2, and uh, t. Well, here, how are we going to deal with this? So let's think about the whole formula. So if we have the starting configuration or the formula representing it, start and then accept, and we can actually, without loss of generality, assume that there's exactly one accept configuration, but there's a way to actually make it so that you can deal with any one of them that you like. And let's say that the total time is capital T, then what we saw before is that T is going to be two to the power D n to the K, so that we wanted it to be a power of two. Well, how big does the recursion actually get? Well, it's only going to add a, it's dividing the original runtime in half every single time. And it's only adding a constant times n to the k stuff right here. And so therefore, it's going to be n to the k at each of the levels. So at each level, we're going to use big O n to the k space. And so therefore, how many levels are there? Well, note that we're dividing by two every single time in the recursion. And so therefore, the amount of steps that we're going down each number of levels is, is going to be the log of this. So therefore, the number of levels is going to be the log of t, which is going to be big O d n to the k. And since d is a constant, because it only depends on the particular language a, and so the constant just falls away, therefore, we're going to have big O of n to the k levels. And so since we need to store that much space per level, Therefore, the total space that we're going to use here is going to be big O n to the 2k. But that's totally fine because k is just a particular number. And so n to the 2 times that number is still a polynomial. It's a horrifically large polynomial, but it's still a polynomial nonetheless. And so therefore, we have reduced a to this problem totally quantified Boolean formula because the answer to whether or not this formula is true is the same as the one for A in the same way that the one for the, the Cook-Levin theorem was true. And the only changes that we had to make were with regard to the amount of space that was used. And the trick for the amount of space was to incorporate the existence of the for all. That's a funny sentence. And so therefore, because we can have this, therefore the amount of space that's used is only a horrifically large polynomial, but it's still a polynomial. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about the TQBF problem down in the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.